so thanks, George, and, and thanks, Stephanie, for um, uh, keeping us all on the sort of straight and narrow and organizing the meeting. It's, um, it's, it's great to see it sort of the, working so well in the virtual format. So um, I'm going to be talking today about a next generation genomic mapping technology, which we which we've shown in the last few years is just this profound improvement on the current approach that most people use, which is ChipSeq. And this we're marketing under the Catan umbrella, which also um, includes Colin Tag, which I won't have a time to really talk about. But the, the take home message, if, if I can, if the only thing you remember from this talk is that I really recommend that everybody uses in situ standards to characterize your antibodies for genomic mapping and monitor your ongoing experiments. And I'll show you some data as to why that's really important. And then the other thing is that cut in front is a dramatic improvement on ChIP-seq on every level. I'm not simply talking minor improvement, I'm talking a dramatic improvement in terms of sensitivity and throughput. So Epicypher is an epigenetics company. And because of that, we're a technology company. And because of that, what we're pr primarily interested in is creating the optimal substrates for anybody who wants to work in epigenetics and chromatin, which are nuclear cells. And we've been extremely supported in this drive by the NIH, for which we are extremely grateful um, from various agencies to help us to develop different parts of the portfolio. But the two things that I want to call attention to are, are the designer nucleosomes, uh, which contain post-translational modifications. These are not analogs or so the modifications themselves. And they're made semi-synthetically, so they're not enzymatics, so they're pure preps. And we are pretty much able to make now any PTM at any location in single or, in, or uh, either as singles or combinatorials. And the second thing is the ability to do barcoding. And when you mix these things, two things together, you have the ability to create standards for genomic mapping approaches. And so this is a ChIP-seq experiment, and we've been working in ChIP for some years trying to... It's a terrible technology. I mean, it, it's, it's a big black box until you get the data out. At the end, it's prone to signal over noise, but one of the major concerns at the very center of it is the inability to know if your antibody is good or bad. So for this, we decided that some years ago that we would assemble with our barcoded nukes panels of related PTMs, and in that way, at least characterize reagents and tell if they're any good. And this is one of the panels that we put together early, which we called K-METSTAT for lysine methyl status. And it's a 16 member panel, which contains H3K4, K9, K27, K36, and histone H4K20, all the PTMs that people were working on in either the mono dye or trimethylated state. And so we've used this, we mix these together and barcoded them and throw them into a chip experiment. And then we say, okay, let's look at the standards recovery. And so for an antibody to pass, it's a pretty simple ask. You have to have less than 20% cross reactivity and greater than 5% recovery of what was added in. And the terrifying thing is that most antibodies cannot do this. And so this is a drive for about almost 400 commercial antibodies where the failure rate is 70%. So if you buy an antibody off the shelf randomly, the chances of you getting it right are less than like three in 10. What people don't do buy antibodies randomly though, they buy antibodies that their colleagues are using and they call it the failure rate for antibodies that are highly cited is actually 80%. Those antibodies have been selected not for specificity, but for their efficiency and seeing that they generate data. So at the end of all this, uh, essentially we, we have reagents that work, but we still had the problem, the chip isn't very good. So we've been working uh, for the last few years with the successor technology, which is Cut and Run, which developed by Uli Lemley and Steve Hennikoff. And so the, the workflow was pretty straightforward. You take cells, you immobilize it onto a solid support, in this case, a magnetic bead. You permeabilize the cells or nuclei. You then diffuse in the same antibody we were working with a moment ago, and that finds its target in, in situ. And then you diffuse in protein A GMNAs, which finds the antibody, and then you activate the MNAs. Wherever the antibody was, this nucleosome now drifts out uh, into the supernate and then it's converted into libraries. And here's the killer step. Everything else is pulled down on the solid support and that takes away the background. And that's what fixes everything. Because if you don't have a huge background, you don't have to continue sequencing everything to try and get your signal above it. So what you end up with is a, is a technology to develop some superior, hugely superior data, sig or data quality in terms of signal over noise, which therefore means you can reduce your cell needs and your sequencing needs. And so for some years now, we've been supporting the community in terms of developing the reagents, including the MNAs, but also developing robust protocols for sample prep and transfer, native or cross-linked cells, nuclei, et cetera, transfer material made to be. We've demonstrated its suitability for a broad range of targets, not just histone PTMs, but also ATPAs as re our um, uh, transcription factors or reader domains. And internally for our service drive, we've automated the, the, foot, the, automated the format to 96 well plates. We're the first generation robotics are capable of processing four plates a week from cells to libraries, which then go onto our own sequencers which means that we're now performing, performing projects at high throughput where we're going from cells to mapped data in two to four weeks. 
So how about the data? How does, what does it look like? So here's an example of H3K4 trimethyl, a mark of um, active promoters, usually tight, tall peaks, a couple of kilobases wide. The chip, in seek in, chip seek from the encode track is around 38 million reads. The internal cut and run track is 3.4 million. So you've got a 10x reduction in, in signal depth, or sorry, in sequencing depth, and yet you're getting improved peaks. Here's K27 trimethyl, a mark of facultative heterochromatin, chip seek and code track around 42 million reads, cut and run track around 3.8 million. So again, same sort of thing. So it's broadly applicable to every PTM target we've gone after, including hardcore heterochromatin like K9 methylation. It's also the other thing that we've done since we've had access to the technology early, we've been able to implement standards within it. And this is the same k uh, composition that I showed you a moment ago, where we have K4, K9, K27, 36, and H4K20, and in the monodye and trimethyl. But in this case, we've changed the footprint such that the nucleosomes are immobilized onto a magnetic bead. Now, these magnetic beads are, are pooled, and they're added into the same ones that are used for the cells. So essentially, they, the standards go through exactly the same processing steps as the cells in a cut-and-run experiment. And when we do that, what we showed in a first pass internally, and these are the reagents that we use and distribute, here's an example of an antibody that are an antibody to 14 of the 15 targets uh, that have exquisite selectivity within the panel across the, not only for position, but also for methyl state. The only one that's currently eluding us still is H4K20 monomethyl. And you can see these reagents can be found. It's just that there's not very many of them. I would also point out that chip capability does not automatically transfer to cut and run. We've characterized antibodies for chip, and now we're, re we're going through exactly the same process again for cut and run. We will never apply a capability from one tech to another anymore. It has to be in situ standards. It's not only, eight, it's not only uh, PTMs that we're going after. Here, for example, was a bit of a home run experiment, and it was looking at ATPases. ATPases are notoriously difficult to chip because their interaction time with chromatin is extremely short in the million microseconds. And this therefore requires exotic cross-linking approaches to try and trap and capture them, which an exotic cross-linking leads to ridiculously high background, ridiculously deep sequencing. But on a native approach here, you see we're getting beautiful tracks for BRG1, uh, surround, uh, in this case, uh, adjacent to promoters. Uh, we can then show that these tracks look fantastic. You can see a, a field for peak structure this, and the signal over noise. The other thing I would call attention to is that in uh, it's been shown some years ago, but this is a reader domain BRD4 of Broma domain protein, and pretty much everywhere where BRD4 is, you find BRG1 associated with it. And this makes sense based on the literature. And then the final target uh, class to represent is a remote, is sorry, um, a transcription factor. This is FOXA1. Here we're looking at, you get a feel for the signal strength of FOXA1 uh, peaks. There's around 6,300 of them in the genome. They're not associated exclusively with promoters, as why would they be? They're associated with primarily seen in promoters, intergenic and intronic regions. And around 35% of these peaks also contain, contain the motif, which is an extremely strong enrichment profile. I would notice, remember, for TFs can get to their location either by direct DNA binding or by association in higher order complexes. You can get a feel here for the um, peak structure as well. So once we found an antibody, and this is to just for the last few seconds, once we found an antibody that works, we then, of course, want to standardize all subsequent experiments. And in this case, we now have the ability to do that with non-PTM proteins. And the way we do it is we go back to nucleosomes, our barcoded nucleosomes again. And in this case, we've coupled the antigen, the immunizing antigen for this anti-FOXA1 directly onto a nucleosome, spike this into a cut and run experiment and determine that we're getting about a 20x enrichment for this. So this reagent can now be used to monitor subsequent experiments and confirm that everything is behaving to spec as you move from one cell or one reaction to another. And so if there's interest to learn more, you can visit our virtual booth. Like I said, I did not get an opportunity, for example, to talk about cut and tag, uh, parallel technology, which has very different capabilities. And you can also chat with one of our team members or watch videos, et cetera. And if there's any concerns or questions, by all means, reach out to me or anybody else at Epicypher. And with that, thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, yes, we have had a question come in, in the backstage. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Yeah, so the question, how are you supporting the field to do cut and run? Say that again, sorry, Nicole. Uh, how are you supporting the field? Uh, pretty much run. everybody from the homebrew guys to the ones who want a full service. So we developed the, um, we, we sell the protein AGMNAs, the enzyme that sits at the core of the technology. We've also mm -hmm. developed robust protocols, which we release everything we do, we release, and that's for every target and things like fixation, et cetera. We've also done kits for people who want that, which includes some of the nucleosome standards. 
And then finally, for those who want it, we do full services. It's currently in soft launch, but uh, we're formally launching it towards the end of the year. And you get it. That's for the reason, of course, that we were so aggressively focused on developing the robotics to improve, improve throughput. Because a standard chip exper or cut and run experiment now for us in a service project can be hundreds or thousands of samples. OK. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Thank you, Michael, for the presentation.